presentation for the good times ahead of us that are coming when we will have that chance again. And then we will also talk about some tips on um, online presentations, which we're all doing now, um, and they have their own um, little intricacies. So thank you, Rachel, for introducing us. I've included um, links to all of our programs in case you wanted to kind of get in touch with us. I actually didn't put emails here, um, but you can find it um, on the uh, websites there. So uh, Sarah and Sveta are joining me today. Um, they'll be doing parts of the presentation. And then after the presentation is done, in about 30 to 40 minutes, we will do breakout rooms. And each one of us will be in a breakout room and do some exercises with you all. Okay, so first we'll talk about presentation structure. Um, this is uh, the part that you do at home um, and it's very important. So um, I think of presentations as a story. So uh, crafting a presentation is really thinking about a story arc. Why a story for sciences, whether in social science or natural science, it's one, it provides you with a good structure which you follow. Um, and as it's described here, every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And typically, um, you need to have a very strong beginning and a very strong end. Basically, research has uh, established that audiences really remember the first few minutes and the last few minutes of a presentation. Um, so how you bookend that presentation is very important. So in your beginning, um, you will pose some kind of dilemmas and um, introduce yourself and pose a dilemma. That's where uh, we are kind of going up the slope here. Conflict rises, right? There's some kind of puzzle. There's something that we are wondering about and we're engaged with it. And then we hear your story about the, your research, your data presentation, your convincing visualizations. Um, and we reach the climax, right? So there is a little bit of a drama to a story as well. It's not just that it provides you with a structure, but it really draws attention because of that structure, right? And then you can um, wrap up and really uh, emphasize why it's relevant, um, the conclusion. Um, it shouldn't be too simple. It shouldn't be too complex. It should be just the right amount of detail. So you'll have to think hard about that part as well. Um, why a story is important again is because it puts your data into perspective right it gives context to the data um, we tell stories with data and they're the main part of our presentations when we do social or natural sciences but we also have to put that data in some kind of context in a perspective that really tells us basically so what so what if we have all that data so what if we did all that research why is that important Right? So, so this is why, again, this kind of narrative structure through which people really remember and learn very well is important also for presentations. There is an academic formula that people follow and um, you should follow as well. Um, it's the opening should be puzzle and your solution. You can kind of preview what you are going to say. And this is uh, the golden rule of uh, presentations here as well, which is Tell people what you're going to tell them, then tell them the material, and then tell them what you told them. This is because in this kind of rule of three, when you repeat it in three different ways and you provide all the evidence, people really remember what the main points are. So um, any presentation that's academic more or less follows the structure of research design. It will come up um, first with the question, um, define the concepts, do a little bit of literature review, then transition to the second point, the research design, how um, you gather the data, what is the data, analyze the data, what are the findings, um, different pieces of evidence, finally sum up and transition to a close. This is not surprising to any of you. Um, however, what is going to be a little bit difficult is to have this in mind, and that's a very main major principle for presentations, less is more. Though not about clothes, not talking about clothes here, but less on the slides is more in this case. You will have to simplify your story to some degree. You have been in your research for months, you know a lot about it. You've probably dealt with a lot of data and analysis and you may not be able to fit all of it on your slides. 
no matter how much you want to. So you're going to need some kind of help to really think about what is the right you know, balance between simplicity and complexity here. One little tip I can give is that anything that's not central to your argument that, you know, just really think about what is it that I can't do without? What is it that my argument is not gonna um, hold up to scrutiny to if I don't mention it? It goes on the main slides. But anything else you can keep for later. Keep it in your back pocket. Have those slides as well, but don't necessarily take up the presentation time to show them. But maybe somebody will ask a question later on, and then you can take that slide out and say, here, I have an answer for that too. So I think about these frameworks as a way to really help you structure your storyline. So we talked about the storyline, that it has a beginning, middle, and end. It builds up a little bit of drama. It helps you structure um, your presentation. But there's many different storylines that, um, that you can adopt. And um, I've kind of gone through many papers and books and have distilled about six. I'm not saying that that's all of the possible storylines here, but I can kind of tell you what I mean. Um, and they, I think they help you really hit the right balance in terms of what is the important things to really cover, how to engage the audience, how to draw their attention throughout the presentation. Um, you can come up with more perhaps during the uh, practice session later. So the first one is the whodunit one. This is a very typical kind of great narrative structure for many books that you uh, I'm sure have read. Um, and you can use this kind of thing in an academic presentation as well. So there is an unexplained phenomenon A, what might be some explanations? I'm going to test several hypotheses to find out. An example comes from Bowling Alone, which is a book published a while ago by Robert Putnam. So he asks this question, there is a decline in participation in civic organization in America, why is that? So he goes through a litany of uh, what are all the possible causes? Is it increasing participation of women in the labor force? He comes up with an answer for that, yes, to some degree. Is it because people move away from their hometowns more frequently than in the past? Is it because people have less leisure time overall than in the past? Or is it some kind of genera generational change? Maybe participation is not as valued anymore as it used to be. Um, so it really keeps you engaged um, to kind of try and understand to what extent each of these factors might be playing a role in this puzzle. Um, another framework that you can think about that helps you really structure your, the way you talk about your research is uh, controversy one. There's actually a group of controversies um, and this is the first one and it really starts with um, thinking about uh, there's some sort of controversy, right? And I want to address that. The first one is you kind of in the role of the contrarian, right? You create the controversy. There is an argument that A is correct, but I'm going to show you that A is not correct and propose that B is correct. Uh, this kind of argument uh, is exemplified by uh, an article from 2006 that basically says, Success of cultural products is typically analyzed as a result of their intrinsic features. So if a painting is very successful, it must be because of the features of the painting. We will show that this approach is wrong. Instead, social influence um, analyzed through social networks is a better way to understand which cultural products become successful and which do not. And then they proceed to explain how they do that. That's uh, the contrarian pose that you can take. In controversy two, you're not the one creating the controversy. There is an existing debate going on and you're gonna be playing the role of the adjudicator. You can say one camp says A, another camp says B, which one is it? So uh, this is an example here of uh, economic uh, paper in economics. What is a better strategy for economic growth? Economic diversification or economic specialization? Scores of economists have debated this issue and I'm here to assess the empirical evidence. I have some way of doing that. 
Right, so again, everybody's sitting at the edge of their seats to understand how is this debate going to uh, play out in your presentation. Yet another controversy is kind of uh, the third way, right? The third way is typically associated with politics, but in this case, it is um, in the case in which you say, one group says A, another group says B, but I'm going to show you that it is really C. Um, so in this case, there is this research that says, you know, innovative ideas um, are, are in, arise when there is a diffusion of ideas. So it's important to have weak ties of a group to outside groups in the environment so that they can uh, import new ideas. Another uh, group of scientists say um, innovative ideas really emerge in groups that are cohesive because they create a safe environment for disagreement, for friction, and for failure. So these two are different theories. They're both onto something, but here's the thing. What is really important is that cohesive groups partially overlap with each other, and we call this new feature structural folds. Right? So that's the third way. You can also uh, go from agreement. You don't have to look for controversies. You can look for agreement. And you can play the role of the tester, right? You can say there is this theory proposed by some researchers and I'm going to bring some more solid evidence in support of this theory. I'm going to test it, right? So for example, in the 1960s, Stanley Milgram conducted a field experiment involving the delivery of a piece of mail to a stranger. He gave this piece of mail to a number of people and he told them you have to mail it to this guy in Boston who is, um, in the business of uh, stock trading. And based on that experiment, um, the so-called theory of the six degrees of separation became very popular. It posits that everyone on the planet is connecting to everyone else by only six degrees. In other words, by only six people. So each one of you is connected to, I don't know, Trump or uh, Brad Pitt by only six other people. So is this actually true? If we really put it to the test, what is the average network path length? So here we come with a really large data set. We now have 60,000 message change, uh, chains originating in six, 163 countries in a search of 18 targets. So it's now not only within the US, it's global, and it's really a lot of data. So lo and behold, yes, six degrees of separation holds. Um, so that's agreement one. Agreement two is the gap filler, right? We know some things about A, um, but they do not give the full picture. We're going to contribute something and fill in some gaps. An example here is medical interventions for behavior in childhood have increased over the past decades. Um, and socioeconomic factors explain these rise are parental socioeconomic status, shift in medical practices, accessibility of drugs. However, these factors don't explain all of the effects of what is going on. One factor that has been overlooked is the role of schooling on stimulant uh, use, whether people are in school or on summer break. We show that stimulant use is based on um, is most prevalent among students of higher uh, socioeconomic status in states with strict policies. So these are uh, some ways in which you can either look for agreement or disagreement and find your role that you play as a researcher um, and how you approach the drama in that story that you're going to tell. Um, like I said, you might be able to find more than these six, uh, but they're a good start. Next, we're gonna talk about crafting your slides. Um, and less is more again. And as you see here, that's not a good example. It's lots of text. Don't start reading it. <laughs> but that is typically what happens when you put a lot of text on the side on the slide. People will start reading it and stop listening to you. And you don't want that. Uh, remember that a presentation is actually uh, a spoken medium, and the slides are there to illustrate what you say, but not to act as a crutch. Um, for what you're trying to say. So practice a lot, have in mind what you're going to say for each slide, don't try to read it, don't try to show how much work you've done by putting it all on a slide, and don't uh, be nervous that you're gonna forget something because it's not on the slide. That's where practice comes in. 
The same can happen not only with text, but with visualizations. Um, the same pitfalls are here. You might want to really be excited and show how much work you've done. And it's such a great visualization after weeks and weeks of crafting. But guess what? Nobody really understands it. Um, it's too much. Uh, it's just not really any, nothing's popping out, right? And here's another example. When everything stands out, nothing does. So even in a simple visualization as this bar chart, still it helps to really draw the eye to what is the important point that you're trying to make. Sometimes a picture is enough. You don't even have to have any text. You don't even have to have um, any complicated charts. You can just take a picture, um, especially if you, it's a picture you yourself took. Uh, maybe you are doing qualitative research um, and that's uh, what, you keep, what you talk about. So I'm gonna give it uh, to Sarah here, who's gonna take over and give you some really great tips on um, more on how to um, craft uh, your, your slides. Okay. I will unmute myself first to get behind the scenes view. I'm also gonna um, like use my phone and just start a timer because I have 10 minutes to talk and I don't wanna talk for too long because that is one of the big no-nos in giving a presentation. I remember someone once saying to me, the worst thing you can do is go over time. If you go over time, your audience will hate you. Uh, and I think that that is often true. <laughs> it can be that strong an emotion. Um, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about, a little bit more about designing slides. Um, it is a process that always takes longer than you think it will. And I will point out that I'm gonna give you some examples of slides more uh, along the idea of how to think about designing slides, not always as examples of like fantastic, perfect slides. Um, but uh, we just talked already about using color. Um, color is very important in slideshows. Um, bear in mind that some of your audience could be colorblind. There are some tools online for learning how to detect what could not appear for um, your audience if they are colorblind. Um, but I just wanted to give you a few examples of some slides. So actually, you're looking at my notes view, aren't you? Or are you looking at my full view? Notes view. Notes view. Oh, that always happens. Let's turn this over. I mean, you could look at my notes. You'll see that I have no notes, which is not always the best. I did it again. Swap to play. There, look. Swap displays. Regular view. Awesome. Okay. So I wanted to point out everyone, uh, you are all doing, I'm sure, really exciting research and I look forward to our breakout rooms to learn about your individual projects. Um, not putting too much on your slides is really a mantra that you should keep. Not having too much text, not making it too complicated. Using this visual medium as much as possible in a visual way. So I just wanted to show you a few examples of using visuals to get across complicated stories. In this case, I'm going to be talking about science projects, but a lot of these tools can be used for multiple fields. So one tool is called the conceptual diagram. It's really using visual representation to help aid in your story of a project. So this is an example of some work I did and I was trying to build out um, a few different objectives of a project that was somewhat circular. So really what I was doing was research on how we can make farms more bird friendly. But in essence, my project was working with farmers to understand the effects of bird friendly farming on the farms themselves. So this has a bit of text on it. And I would normally spend more time explaining this slide, but it's a quick way of kind of introducing the overall system that I was working in. This is an example from uh, one of the master students in the E3B program. And this was, I wanted, I wanted to point out through this that slides evolve over time. So this is a really nice slide. It's a really nice representation of the system in which she works, which is understanding the effects of urban cat colonies, the ecology of the system with urban cat colonies. And this is a nice visual for explaining the different types of outdoor cats. And so this alone is a very nice slide, but I just want to show that even when a slide is nice, you can take additional steps 
to improve it even more. Um, so this one, it's got a more cohesive color scheme. It's got a more cohesive landscape. She's used these really cool icons of different cats and pictures of the cats on the top. And then she still has this um, lower area where it's explaining kind of how the different communities of cats differ from one another. Um, if you're working in a system that is kind of acknowledged for being a complicated system, there are uh, usually pre-existing conceptual diagrams on the web. So uh, a number of the students in our department work on the Lyme disease system. And so I've seen some version of this conceptual diagram a few times, and that's totally fine. Make use of existing resources if they are good. Something like the CDC, you don't usually need permission from them to use their conceptual diagram in a scientific presentation uh, for graduate work. But if you are taking a, a conceptual diagram that someone else has developed, you may need to gain permission for it. Um, switching gears a little, think about your text. You want to try to avoid serif fonts, so fonts that have these serifs at the bottom, these little flares where they have feet. Um, these types of fonts can be harder to read. So try to stick, even though it's not always as, as exciting, try to stick with the most clear and the largest text that you can on all of your slides. Um, this is, some of these are, are from a book on how to give scientific presentations. Um, when should you use a, a table in a presentation? My advice is almost never. Um, tables are usually meant to display large amounts of complicated information in one area, and they're great in publications usually in the format where you're presenting to a group, you will lose them in a slide like this. There's too much text. They won't listen to you if they're trying to understand the table uh, or they'll listen to you and they won't be able to, to capture what's in the table. I wanted to show you an example of a table that I've kind of over time tried to change from a written paper format into a more visual format. So this is an example of a table from my PhD. Um, this is basically that same table that was put into a magazine format for farmers to um, be able to consult. And then this is actually the visual that I use for that table. You need to think about why you're showing your audience anything that you're showing them. As Elena said, things are, you know, you, you don't have to get every single point across. Your audience will really only walk away with one or two points from your presentation. And so the reason for a table is often to kind of display the wealth of information on a topic or to compare two or three different things. So in this case, I was trying to highlight how many different studies there were across the world in a few different crops on my, my specific field. And so rather than using a table like this, just demonstrating through some simple images and a map, and this, is, this didn't take very long to put together, can really get that point across more clearly and more quickly. And it doesn't distract people from what you're saying. So if I was speaking during this slide, and right now while I am sleep speaking, I mean, we're in Zoom, so you might not be looking at the screen at all, but <laughs> if you are looking at the screen, you're probably looking at this map and hopefully you're also looking at me and what I'm doing and listening to what I'm saying. If you do want to include an actual table, make sure you walk your audience through it. So this is a table I've used in previous presentations. It's got a lot of information about the cost benefit analysis of, of installing a hedgerow on farms. I mean, you guys don't need to know my field to kind of get at what uh, the purpose of this could be. Um, but what I wanted my audience to take away from this table is not all of these individual costs here, but what the total cost of installing hedgerows is and what the benefits is. And actually in this case, the problem is that the people who put this table together in the first place hadn't assessed many of the different components of wildlife, uh, which is what hedgerows bring in. So overlaying some kind of, of, of conclusion onto a table or highlighting rows or doing something that really draws the eye of your listener so they're not overwhelmed by information. I thought we'd have a little bit of, uh, of audience participation. Does anyone want to share what they don't like about this slide? Feel free to either do the raise your hand thing or uh, unmute yourself. I don't know if I can see the hands. Cool. 
crickets. No? Oh, I hear it. Sack, do you want to? Sach. Um, Sach, sorry. Yeah, I don't like the color of the font, the yellow. Okay, why not? And the gray. I think it's, it could be hard for some people to read. And also the really fancy falcons for grapes so, uh, font. It's beautiful, but um, it's not very accessibility friendly. I agree. Anything else? There's not a lot of text on this slide, but it's like not nice to read. Um, it's, it's busy, it's distracting. Um, I can see, uh, I can't see your name, but the person who just raised their hand. Uh, Michael. Um, Michael, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so I think, I mean, the background being blue is very strange because it's a flat blue. Um, and you have yeah, all these different colors mixing together um, for seemingly like no reason. I mean, you might highlight a word or something if you want to emphasize it, but there's like underlines and highlights and kind of italics, which is strange. And then there's a picture of like a map up in the corner, which has no indications as to what it is or why we should care about it um, and what it's doing there. I'm assuming it has to do with some sort of vineyards and falcons, but we, we don't know. And like, yeah, everything being in different size and different colors and different fonts is very distracting. This would be a super yeah. cool presentation on distracting like presentations. Yes, that's what it is. It's a bad, it's a bad presentation about presentations. Um, and let, wait, let me check my time, make sure I'm not gonna be hated. Ah, I'm basically there. So yes, this is a slide that is an example of, of a bad slide. Um, this is text, like something that you can easily speak over other things. And remember, you don't have to squeeze everything onto a single slide. You can have multiple slides to explain a single point. So in this case, this is like the background information of my PhD thesis and use photos. Um, use map. I mean, if you guys are, are able to use maps, um, really draw your listeners into what it is you're talking about and, and let them have the experience of where you are. And so these two slides, this one explaining the area I worked in, and this one where I spend some time really explaining the project that I worked on um, and the, the kind of reasoning behind it, they have very little text on them. Really, this text is only here because I wanted to make sure that I uh, acknowledge the people that did the translocations of these birds that I was studying, um, but use visuals as much as you can to make your point and to make your comparisons. Um, I will stop there, I think. So I'm going to pass, who am I going to pass the, the microphone to? So I'm going to continue and I'm going to share my screen again. Um, going back to the previous slides, because now I want to talk a little bit about in-person presentations. And thank you so much, Sarah. This was a really fantastic set of slides you showed. Um, a lot of work in, went into each one, I'm sure. Um, I think I've heard some people say that you shouldn't be able to really understand a whole lot just from looking at the slides. <laughs> it's not like reading a paper. Right, so if you, if you are understanding, uh, if it reads like a paper, then it's not good. So um, again, for those times when we do have in-person presentations, um, there's some tips that we should be aware of. Uh, and the first one is about body language. Um, and so I'm gonna give it to Tsveta here to talk about body language. Tsveta, I, I can just keep this on and you, you can just take over talking. That sounds good. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so happy to see you all. And let me give a shout out to one of my own students whom I see here. Hi, Michael. Um, what I wanted to talk to you about very quickly here is the way in which we can use our body, our voice, our eyes, our gestures to communicate in nonverbal ways with the audience. Think about the way I greeted you. What was the feeling you got? Hello, everybody. I'm so happy to have you here today. Compare that with, hello everyone, 
it's good to have this presentation together. Just think about how your own energy and how your feelings get translated and they can be really infectious. They can help draw in your audience or perhaps by your own uncertainty um, and, and lack of confidence, you could, you could distract everyone and turn them off and make, them, make it easy for them to um, think about other things. So really, when you begin a presentation and when you prepare for the presentation, summon all your excitement about the topic. Chances are you're writing about something that you care deeply about. So tap into that and channel that to help your audience connect with your topic. Convey your energy. That's the first point. The second important point that I wanted to discuss today is one of gestures. And the rule of gestures is that you can go and you should go as big as you can. Why is that? There is research which shows that how confident people are gets manifested in the amount of space they occupy. And so if you're sort of, if you close yourself, if you hold your hands together, if you try and minimize yourself, your audience perceives you as lacking confidence and therefore they might not even trust your presentation, even if you're an expert on the topic. And so to convey this confidence, you want to sit up confidently and occupy space sort of on the table, at the presentation and make your gestures as big as possible. Again, Think about, and this is really hard on Zoom, I don't have, and I unfortunately don't have enough space at home to really give you a sense of what this would be like. But sometimes people are tempted to kind of make these small gestures that might feel comfortable to you as the presenter, but to the audience are, are, are uncomfortable, they're awkward. Instead, when you have big sweeping gestures, as I said, this is more inviting and more confidence projecting. So again, bigger gestures, um, and the grab attention that increase the impact of your words. Think of unlocked gestures, right? So you don't want that, even though that's confident, you want to be unlocked because that's inviting. Uh, the imagery is you're stretching your hands, you're inviting your audience to participate rather than telling them, that's it, I'm protected, I'm a close fortress and you need to stay away. Um, and then think about the gestures as, as, as being very deliberate use the gestures to invite the audience to draw them in rather than to be fidgeting and sometimes we always do that we often do that right where we sort of fidget with our hands or we have our pens and that is distracting so be purposeful with gestures okay convey your energy that was the first point go big and deliberate with gestures that was the second point the third point is about posture I can't illustrate it myself, but I would ask you to look at the three different pictures that we have, uh, four different pictures that we have on the slide. And, um, and let me tell you that the research on posture is that what people find most comforting and again, conveying most confidence is if you stand, standing up straight, shoulders down, hands by your body, and have your feet about shoulder length apart. So this most natural confident posture. If you can maintain as much of that as possible throughout the presentation, that would be a good foundation of this uh, uh, um, nonverbal communication with your audience. Why is that? If you're sort of uh, tilted to one side, again, you're, you, it, imagine you're, you're sort of the human version of the, of the Tower of Pisa where everyone is distracted by wait, waiting for the moment when you tilt over. Um, it's distracting. Similar things with closing your hands or putting them even behind your back. These are gestures that have meaning um, that again, is, is, it can be distracting, it can convey lack of confidence. So even though it might seem uncomfortable at first, what you want to do is try and practice to sit straight with your hands down, except when you gesticulate and to be as open as possible throughout your presentation. So posture, again, up, sitting upright and, and open. Um, another point is, and that's especially true for in-person communication, is uh, to think about how you move throughout the space that you're given. And um, here the rule is that you don't want to hide, you want to have contact with your audience. 
You want to face your audience, again, with your body, with your feet, with your face, with your gesture. You want to be, again, as open as possible. And then you want to be deliberate. So you can use your movement to pace the presentation. You can make a point and move forward a little bit. Make another point. Walk all the way across the stage and pause. You can make another point, right? So you see how you can combine your gestures, your voice, and your movement to create natural breaks in your presentation, which A, gives the audience a sense of, okay, we've completed one point, we're moving to the next. It gives them a sense of pace and a break. So it makes it easier for them to absorb and to follow you. What you don't want is to pace, sort of sometimes we do, we pace back and forth, back and forth, or side to side, side to side. And so with movement as with gestures, you want big movement. If you're going to move, step forward to your audience. That draws them in. Pause, move to the side. That signals we've now moved to a different point. So, but you see, it's a big movement. It's a deliberate movement. Okay, so. Energy, positive and excited. Gestures, big. Movement, big and deliberate, just as gestures. Posture, open, again, as with movement facing your audience. Now, what to do with your visuals and how you interact with them. It's great to have PowerPoint, but as I'm sure you've seen this many times because it is so human and yet so wrong, one very common mistake is that, um, especially if you're presenting in person and you have your slides behind you, for you to turn and look at the slides. It's a big mistake. Why? Because you've turned away from your audience. You're now speaking to the PowerPoint instead of to those who should be listening to you. And so what you want to do, of course, is know your slides, have them in front of you, and almost have them as a background. Almost ignore them. Have them complement you. Think about it as you're seamlessly switching from painting a picture, speaking to it, moving to the next one without turning back to look at the picture or, or do much too much pointing. You, you want that to be your background. And again, if you've designed your slides carefully, as Sarah recommended, you wouldn't have that much to point or read. You'd have images or a little bit of text that anchors or, or amplifies a big point that flags an important um, argument that you want to make. So again, don't look at your slides. Instead, have this um, sort of unspoken dialogue between you and the slides. Okay. And um, of course, the purpose of that is such that your eye contact is with the audience. And when you do look at the audience, Again, what you want to do is you might see a friend in the audience or a friendly face or someone who is just very nice and pleasant and they might smile at you. And the human thing is for us to lock our eyes on that person because they're a supportive member of the audience. But you shouldn't do that. You should speak to all of, to everyone in the audience. And so a good rule is to start an argument and look at, let's say, to divide the audience in, let's say, thirds or sixths if if, if it's too big an audience. And to pick a corner, speak to a point, and then at that point, shift your eyes, make contact with a different segment of the audience to make another point, and then move to the next. And so you're taking turns, checking in with the different segments of your audience. Because again, we as humans respond to eye contact. And if the presenter looks at you, or at least seemingly in your direction, chances are you'll be more engaged in the presentation. So you want to make sure that you draw in and engage your entire audience. Finally, voice. Voice is so important to presentations, whether they're online or in person. Voice is magical. What you do with the volume, the pace, the pitch really helps to make or break a presentation. If you sit and mumble, no one's going to hear. They might not even care to do it unless it's a pause and you're creating drama by being quiet, deliberately quiet. But most of the time, you really want to project your voice. And again, Michael will, will be my witness here. We try and practice projecting in class all the time because it's hard to hear. And if you can't hear your presenter, you're not going to take, get their point. 
So you really want to project and practice doing that at home, in class, in various, op any opportunity you have. What you also want to do is practice pacing yourself. Think about what are the key points of the presentation? Where do you want to stop to draw the audience's attention? And, or give them a chance to absorb the point before moving on. Pauses are really important, as is the pace of your voice. If you talk quickly, you might be going through details. But when you get to a concluding point, to an important point, you want to slow down and give your audience the opportunity to absorb what you're saying. So think about the pacing. It's really, really important. And one mistake that I want to mention here is people, uh, especially if they're watching their time, they'll start hurrying and, and try to squeeze in as much information as possible and sort of run out of steam at the end of the presentation without really pausing, concluding, giving a chance, uh, giving the audience a chance to reflect on what's been presented. So you really don't want to do that. You want to pace yourself. You want to be careful about the tone because the tone conveys a lot about your emotions. You want to be confident, you want to speak calmly. And it's really hard because especially when we get nervous, our voices tend to go higher and higher and it's horrible. And I remember many presentations which were done, which were delivered by um, really even prominent academics. But whenever they get nervous, you, you sense that, you sense that through the tone and it's distracting yet again. And you wonder, hmm, I wonder if there's a problem with the argument. Hmm, I wonder if the evidence is not strong enough. Why is this person so nervous? So again, however hard it, must, it, it might be, you want to make sure that you breathe. Um, and so you allow your voice and yourself to come down and present in a, with the right tone and the right pitch. And I've already talked um, uh, about pauses and, and, and pacing um, in that way. Um, and so uh, with that, let me sum up the, the points about body language that you should practice and, and, um, and pay attention to. Again, you want to project energy and enthusiasm and passion for your topic. You want to have big gestures, deliberate gestures, big movement, deliberate movement. You want to use your posture to convey your confidence and calmness and comfort with the topic. You want to have your eyes on your audience and to connect with the audience and draw them in. And you want to use your voice to mirror the storyline, the plot line, such that the beginning and the ends are bookmarked with pauses. And then you can use your voice and the pace to signal when you've gotten to the climax or the important points, when you've gotten, when you've dis disclosed who's done it. Thank you. Thank you, Sveta. This was uh, really great. Um, we practice and we keep learning and keep, um, no, nobody's perfect, but practicing would really help here for sure. Um, I'll continue with no mentioning handouts here for um, in-person presentations that you can use that uh, little device and give it out to people. In this example I have here, it's just terms that maybe this presentation is going to be using and they're sort of complicated. So the presenter gave this out to, so that people can keep referring to it. So slides are good. I mean, handouts are good when there's something that people might need to keep referring to as the presentation goes on. Um, no point in giving out slides with, let's say, the main findings. Um, that, that is not going to be helpful, but something that they will need to kind of look um, again and again at. So a few other important details. Um, I'm sorry, um, I think this was partially covered, so talk loudly and pay attention where the microphone is. Look into the faces of the audience. Arrive early. That's very important. You want to make sure that you test your technology, your slides, you get a feel for the room. How much movement can you have there? Where is the audience going to be sitting? What is the technology? Um, ask a friend to give you feedback. So part of the practicing is that you can do it in front of others so they can tell you, you talk too fast. Uh, you need to find the right pace. Also be yourself. Don't do things that don't feel right for you. 
right? Sometimes you feel, you see people doing humor and you feel that you should be doing humor to engage the audience. But I would say only use that if it actually feels comfortable for you, if you don't feel like you're forcing yourself. So again, practicing um, would really make it better over time. A few notes about online presentations. I'm gonna be fast about this. The first thing is get the lightning right. So balanced writing, we have two slides here. One is balanced lightning, one does not have balanced lightning. So to achieve that, if possible, have a light source behind the computer that goes towards your face. So sitting in front of a daylight uh, window would be great because the light is the fuse light and it will enlighten your face and it, it will look good. Um, short of that, you can put a light behind the screen. Um, so that your face is really the one that gets the most um, light on it. Another one is play to the camera. I, when I bought my computer, I have to say, I didn't know that the camera is actually put on the very bottom of my lid. So it's actually really low. So right now, um, I have to buy a different camera to put uh, kind of an eye level or elevate my computer so that it, the camera is more at eye level. That's important because you want to be looking at the camera when you're speaking. That creates the uh, impression that you're actually talking to people and not above their heads or looking somewhere else. So do look into the camera. Um, and don't forget, if you're on a panel and you're not the one talking at that moment, usually when you go to a conference, you'll be sitting on a panel with a couple of other people and they will be the ones presenting. But even if you're not presenting, pay attention, look at the camera, look engaged, that's important as well. Pick the right background. So it could be um, some place in your home if it looks like a workspace, maybe it has some books in the background. If you can't find a space like that, you can add these virtual backgrounds that Zoom has and they have to be professional. In this case, if you're presenting to a conference, I would say, you know, a Columbia kind of photo of the campus or some other Columbia related uh, image would be appropriate because you are coming as uh, MA students um, from the university, it's professional. You probably don't want to put something too busy, too distracting, too much patterns. Um, and kind of bear in mind, the virtual backgrounds can be tricky. I think, you know, sometimes the, the person as they move kind of get a little bit, uh, you lose some of their parts somehow <laughs> when you have a virtual background. Um, so I would caution against using them too much, but if you don't have another option, then definitely use them and, and put a professional one, probably not one on um, of a beach somewhere. Um, then also build in redundancy, right? Things happen during presentations. So give your slides to someone else too. So some, sometimes you don't know, maybe you need to ask uh, the panel discussion or moderator to share the slides uh, because something happens uh, to yours. May, make sure your connection is fail safe. If you have Wi-Fi and you also plug into a modem, so you're really foolproof with connection. Test your microphone. If needed, get an external one. Test your camera, test headpieces if you need to use them. So that's about it for the online presentations. I'm going to say a few things for the question and answer session. There's usually a Q&A part after a presentation. So this is your time to shine as well. It's a little less formal, but you need to be prepared for that as well. Try to anticipate the questions. What might people ask? If you've spent months really thinking about your research, you probably have already gotten those questions asked by advisors, by other students, and you have probably thought about them already quite extensively, so you can anticipate them and prepare answers um, so you don't have to think on your feet um, during the presentation. As I mentioned earlier, if you feel that there's more information you can share, prepare extra slides and take one out um, when somebody asks a question that really asks for more details. That would be perceived as really very well prepared um, and that you've done your homework and gone beyond. Um, if you don't understand a question, if you're not clear what the person's really asking, 
either re repeat it back to them and try to understand if that's what they mean, um, ask for clarification, right? But try to really understand what is the question. Don't take criticism personally. Answer. Do not debate. Try to answer the question and just stop there. Um, don't really uh, get these emotions that somebody is trying to attack you by attacking your data, your line of thinking. Um, take all of these questions as, as legitimate inquiries um, that are welcome to any scientific enterprise. And finally, it is okay to say that you don't know. Um, you're not required to know everything. You're not required to have an answer for everything. You can always say that you can find out more, that you can think about that for next time for, for, for the research. Um, or maybe some, you know, often people ask questions that are really all, not all that relevant. You know, you're presenting about A um, and the question is about B, then you really, uh, it's okay to say, I don't know, this is uh, beyond the scope of my research. Um, so this is, uh, we're going to stop here. Again, practice, practice, practice. And in that spirit, we're going to have breakout uh, groups now and try to practice a few of these things. Uh, we have three here that I've prepared. It's uh, up to each break room to decide which uh, ones they want to take. I'm going to stop sharing right now. And I